you're here, let's stand and worship.
you spoke a word of life began Told oceans where to start and where to end You spoke in motion, time and space But still you come and you call to me by Still stands 
you believe that today? Come on, let me hear you. I can't see you. I need to hear you. Come on. How many of you believe you're a child of God? We've been talking about deliverance in this series. We're going to finish up this series today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to, to come into our hearts. I want you to, in your heart and your mind, say, Lord Jesus, I need to hear from you today. I open my heart to you. I open my life to you. Come and speak to me today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so we're finishing up our series today on spiritual warfare. We've, we've covered a lot of stuff over these last several weeks about who our enemy is, about the reality of this invisible spiritual war, about how um, the, the demonic forces work best when they have some human host to work through and how we give them opportunities by, by um, participating in sin. We open the door. We'll let them come into our lives. So I want to give you some facts about spiritual warfare before we get into our last topic today. Number one fact about spiritual warfare, God has defeated Satan and his agenda. God has delivered us from the penalty and power of sin and one day from the very presence of sin. So the penalty and power means if I ask Jesus to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life and I have been chained to some kind of sin, he releases me from that. The only way that I can go back into that sin, that that sin has power over me, is if I choose to bind myself to that sin once again. I am choosing to go back into sin. It makes no sense, right? Somebody tell me that makes no sense. The only way that you can have the power and the penalty of sin still reigning in your life is if you willingly chain yourself to sin. Now, here's the cool thing. Not only has he delivered us from the penalty and the power of sin, one day he's going to deliver us from the presence of sin. When you die, if you're a child of God, you get to live with him forever. Or if we're still alive when he returns, we get to go be with him forever. We're delivered from the very presence of sin. Does that sound kind of cool? Yeah, I'm not taking this off for a while, so y'all don't, don't worry about that. All right, all right. Number two fact about spiritual warfare. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and we have all the rights and privileges that being a child of God brings. Now, this is not a blank check where I'm saved now, I can live like hell on earth. No. You only have, your, your, um, you only have the freedom in Christ if you're under his authority. It's not a blank check where you go do wrong and he's, oh, I'm a Christian. He's going to forgive me. No, that is not the way it works. When you're under authority, you have power. You are free from the power and the penalty of sin. Um, 
Number three fact about spiritual warfare. To win this spiritual battle requires us to put on and use the spiritual armor that God has provided for us. God won't dress us for the battle or put the weapons in our hands. So I think I put a picture in there. Is that in there? Okay. So here's just, let's talk about the armor of God for just a minute. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the armor of God. And the order of the armor is extremely important. If you notice this little belt here, this is the belt of truth. This is the first thing that, that Paul talks about, if you don't have truth in your life, none of the rest of the armor works. You are not fighting with God's, war, uh, God's power if you don't start with truth. So we start with the belt of truth. Then everything else attaches to that belt. And so then the next thing is uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Your heart has to be protected. If you're out and, and you're giving your life, you're binding yourself to sin, your heart is not protected. You're not wearing the breastplate of righteousness. And then comes the, the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the sandals of peace, or the, the, the shoes of peace. We have to have the right message. We're not to go out and confront people. We're supposed to love them and give them grace. And then goes the helmet of salvation. And then comes the sword of the spirit, which is, or I'm sorry, the shield of faith. It's not just a shield. Your shield is faith. I hope you see the difference in that. It's not something you have to believe in God and your belief in God shields you from the fiery darts of the enemy. And then the last one is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Quite honestly, most of us don't know the word of God, so we have no weapon. So you put it on in order. God doesn't dress you. He's given us the, the, all of the armor of God. We have to choose every day to put that on. If we don't, then we're asking to be defeated. Now, one more thing, one more section before we get into today's topic. Five times you should expect, you can kill the background on that, Gary, up there in the corner. Five times you should expect spiritual attack. Number one is when you are about to experience spiritual growth. The enemy of God does not want you to grow, so he will do everything. He will throw all of hell against you to keep you from growing. Number two, when you're invading enemy territory, every time Paul went to a new place in the New Testament, when he's writing letters, every time he went to a new place, he would start talking about God, and then the enemy of God would raise up opposition to him. We went to Haiti. I went 10 times to Haiti. Our church went eight times to, to Haiti, almost every time. Before we would even get into the country, there would be some type of opposition. Did you read this story? It's danger. How can you take the, our family, our, our, our loved ones to Haiti to tell them about Christ? We would have opposition in this country. We would have opposition in Haiti. When we went to Belize, the first year we went, we went out to this place where they wanted to build a new church. And, and they asked me to pray on the foundation. There, there was just a, a foundation that was there. And so I prayed. And I said, God, we pray that you destroy the strongholds of the enemy in this place, having no idea, uh, till afterwards one of our, our praying pelican leaders came up and said, you have no idea, but this used to be a center of witchcraft in Belize. And you just prayed that the, the strongholds would be destroyed. And I said, well, I didn't know that has to be God. The next year when we go, they're starting to build. We raised enough money for them to build this church. And they're starting to put down the foundation. The very first day we're there, we're working in the shade. It was the strangest thing ever. I got this weird headache, and, and you know, it's not like we're overheated. I just felt horrible, and then Janie felt it, and Rachel felt it, and Rachel cousin felt it, and several of us just felt like we were being attacked. So the next day, we decided, we're going to circle this foundation before we ever start to work. So we would pray in silence. The, the workers would be over there putting up the, the, the cinder blocks, and we would be circling this, this foundation and this place where we were working seven times. Just like Joshua circled Jericho, we prayed and we prayed and we believed that God delivered us from whatever was going on in that place. Why would we be attacked? It's because we were invading enemy territory. And I'm just going to tell you this, when we go to Elkhart next week, and I'm not, we are, we are going outside the walls of the church so the enemy of God does not want us to be successful. And he will try everything to keep people from hearing about this God who loves them enough to give them backpacks and food and, and clothing. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we can expect spiritual attacks. So, so we need people to be praying. In fact, I want people to be praying every, every day. If you would be willing to, to pray for the campus, maybe even go out and drive around the campus. You don't have to do it seven times. If you feel like doing it seven times, be that crazy person that drives seven times and prays and watches the walls fall down spiritually. But I'm serious. I want people to pray every day. So if you'd be willing on the back of your registration card, say, I'll take and tell me what day that you'll go out there and just pray. Take 10 minutes and pray that God will do something that we would not even believe if he told us ahead of time. The next time you can expect is when you're exposing um, the enemy. This series, 
There have been strange things that have happened in, in my house, right? There's times I wake up at night and there's just this fear that has seized me. And I sit up in bed and I say, the Lord rebuke you because I know the enemy does not want me to speak truth. I know the enemy doesn't want you to hear truth. And so if, if Michael the archangel, if that's how he handled dealing with Satan, that's what I do. Janie said she started doing that too. We just speak out loud. The Lord rebuke you. I'm a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And so we just speak it out. You just be ready. If you're exposing the enemy, you're going to be attacked. Number four is breaking unholy relationships. (sighs) One of the reasons we have so much trouble in Celebrate Recovery is because people are breaking many times not just an addiction, but an unholy relationship. And they have chosen to put themselves in a relationship, and the enemy does not want them to get out because that relationship drags them away from God over and over and over again. They know it. Everybody knows it. The enemy says, no, let's keep going back. And then the fifth one is when you're about to receive the blessing of God, the enemy wants you to quit before you receive the blessing of God. Because if you don't receive a blessing, you don't pass that blessing on to anyone else. That's what Christ followers can expect. What about non-Christ followers, non-believers? Well, according to Paul, the unsaved person is free from righteousness. Here's what he says in Romans 6.20. When you were slaves to sin, when you were handcuffed to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. So if you're free from being controlled by the righteousness of God, what controls you? Sin. You're controlled by sin. Slavery to sin leads us deeper and deeper into sin so that it becomes not just one set of handcuffs holding you to something, but multiple sets of handcuffs holding you to something in your past. And it makes it harder and harder and harder for you to break free from your past. And it's just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son, when he was at home, he decided, well, you know, I want, I want my freedom. It's too restrictive here under the authority of my father. So he goes to him and he, he, he asks him for the, the uh, inheritance, his his, his inheritance. So here's the thing. Number one, he was a slave to wrong desires. And this is the pattern that happens in your life. You are a slave to something, wrong desires, and you let them dominate your thinking. He's thinking, dad won't die. This is the story of the prodigal son. Dad won't die. So I'm going to say, hey, dad, go ahead and give me my inheritance. You're, you're, you're living too long, sucker. Give me my inheritance so I can be free from you. That's what he does. So he was slaves to wrong desire. Then he was a slave to wrong deeds. When he got his inheritance, he goes away and lives horribly. And he becomes chained to all of these wrong deeds, and then he literally becomes a slave whenever he's taking care of pigs. And this is the worst thing a Jew could do is have to feed pigs because they were unclean. If the pig is unclean and you're the the slave taking care of the pig, you are bound. You are far from the Father's will for your life. He wanted to find himself, but he lost himself. What he thought was freedom turned out to be the worst kind of slavery. And And the Bible says it's only when he came to his senses Some of you know what it means to hit rock bottom. You hit rock bottom, you come to your senses, you come back to the Father, the Father frees you. So the same pattern for you, wrong desires, wrong deeds, slavery to sin. So this is how it happens. Repeated sin produces strongholds. You thought you could be free, but you aren't free. You just repeated this over and over again. Strongholds literally means to gain mastery over, or to be under the influence of. So let's say, you, you understand this, let's say a Christ follower goes out and buys a 12-pack on their way home from church today, God forbid, and they drink that and they get drunk. The, even though they are a Christian, they are now under the influence of what? Alcohol. So a Christian can make a foolish choice and get drunk and be under the influence. I believe a Christian can also chain themselves to unholy people. The Bible says bad company corrupts good morals in in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Is it 10.31? Bad company corrupts good morals. You can choose to be bound to bad company and it will pull you down. You can be under the influence of people who are not bringing you towards God. So in this series, so far we have looked at strongholds of anger. We've looked at strongholds of sexual sin. Today we're going to look at the third biggest stronghold, godlessness. Now the story of Jacob and Esau, you may have heard it. Um, They were the sons of Isaac and Rebekah, and they were the first twins mentioned in the Bible. Even before they were born, they were struggling with one another. It says they're fighting in the womb. And and when Esau comes out first, Jacob has a hold of his heel. And and that's how he got his name, supplanter or deceiver. And they they had this whole lifetime of 
conflict between the two brothers. Now, Esau was the oldest. He was a macho man. Jacob was a mama's boy. Since Esau was born first, he would receive what's called the birthright. The birthright is for the firstborn son, he gets a double portion of the inheritance of his father, which I think is totally unfair. I'm the third boy born, so if this were still in effect, my oldest brother Larry would get twice as much as me. That's just not fair. It's just the way it was. He would get not only that, but he would get the blessing of his father as the oldest son, as the, as the patriarch, the new patriarch of the family going forward. And these twins grew up very, very differently. Look what Scripture says in Genesis 25, starting in verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. He was was a homemaker. I mean, that's what that means. That's the Hebrew for he, he he was a mama's boy. He stayed home. There's nothing wrong with being a homemaker unless your older brother is a macho man. So look what happens. Isaac, the father had a taste for wild game. He loved it when Esau would go out and hunt and bring him some some good meat and potatoes. Isaac loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. This is the definition of dysfunctional family. Now, who in this room knows what it's like to be your parent's favorite? And if you have a sibling in the room, maybe you shouldn't raise your hand. Who in this room knows what it's like not to be your parents' favorite? Ooh, there's a lot of those. This is messed up. One of the things I love about the Scripture, Scripture doesn't whitewash the past of the heroes. Every other world religion does. They'll take the founder and they'll make him sound way better than he was. Now, Jesus, you can't make him sound bad because he was perfect. But all the other people in Scripture, totally imperfect, totally dysfunctional family. One day Esau goes out and he's hunting and he comes back in and, and he's, he's, he was unsuccessful in the hunt and he's famished. And he smells what his, his younger brother is cooking. And you ever walked in and you're just so hungry and something smells good. Janie said they were walking around the neighborhood out at the campus yesterday, and they smelled bacon. And they're going, y'all smell bacon? Y'all smell bacon? So they're talking to one man. He goes, I smell bacon too. I don't know where it is. I'm trying to find out who of my neighbors is cooking bacon. Esau comes in, and it's not bacon. It's one of his favorite meals. And his brother who's cooking, his name means deceiver. Remember that. So Jacob, deceiver, offers to give his brother some of the stew in exchange for his birthright, the special honor that the oldest son would have. Look what happens. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. Now this, the, 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 uh, where is that? Is it not in there? Okay, this is, uh, this is continuing the story. If you have your, your Bibles open, there we go. I'm dying of starvation. Uh, He said, give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. Now, this is actually in the scripture. The parentheses is in there. His name is red. This is a nickname. How would you like to be nicknamed your worst ever screw up in life? Hey, red, not only was he called red, but the, the, the descendants, he becomes a father of a nation. They're called the Edomites, the redites. Why are you called redites? Because our father Made a stupid trade. All right, we'll get to that in a second. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as firstborn son. So red and deceiver, so Esau and Jacob, have a contest. Now, if you're a guy who always just goes after whatever you think, you say, you do whatever you want to do, and you're going against a schemer, a deceiver, who's going to win this contest? The schemer. It's no contest. Does anyone think it's a good trade? A bowl of red stew, lentil stew, for your birthright. Anyone want to make that trade? No. So he says, look, I'm dying of starvation. What good is my birthright? I'm going to die if I don't get some of that soup. You're going to get the birthright anyway. Dramatic much? I'm going to die. Give me some stew. But Jacob said, the deceiver says, first, you must swear. 
So he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's make this legal. I ain't giving you some stew till you, till you sign over the rights, that your birthright is mine. So what does Esau do? Red. We should just call him idiot. He swore an oath. He made it legal. Give me the papers. I'm so hungry. Give me the papers. I'll sign the papers. You can have it all. Thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. And then look what happens. Then Jacob, all right, it's legal. Cool. Gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. And look what, I put it in red because I want you to remember this word. So Esau did, what is that word? I want you to say it with your teeth gritted like you have been deceived. Esau did what? He despised his birthright. Why? I believe Esau despised himself for making such a stupid trade. He despised everything about the blessing of God. So he chose, Esau chose the temporary need over the blessing of God. He swapped salvation for stew. He took gas over God. He went chasing after wind, and he ended up with a stronghold as a result of his choice. Or you can say it this way. He sold the blessing of God for a bowl of soup. What an idiot. What have you traded for the blessing of God? I'm going to trade a one-night stand for the blessing of God. I'm going to go after a promotion, and I'm going to trade that for the blessing of God. I'm going to trade my whole future for a bowl of soup. I'm going to trade my kid's future for a bowl of soup so that my kid can be the best at whatever. And then later in life, Isaac's going to die, and one of the last things the father would do is he'd place his hands on the child, and he would bless them. So when it came time for Isaac to bless his sons, Jacob the schemer and his mother who loved him best and was also a schemer, they tricked. Isaac was, was getting old. His eyesight was gone. They tricked him into thinking that, that Jacob was Esau so he would put his hands of blessing on him. Now, here's, the, here's what's really stupid about this whole series, uh, scene. God had already said long before they were born that the younger one would be in charge, that he would choose Jacob over Esau. But Jacob chose to get the birthright in his own way, and his mom helps him get the blessing in his own way, not with the blessing of God, and it costs him. (laughs) When Esau found out that his blessing had been given to his brother, what do you think Red did? Was he happy about it? No, he was hopping mad, and he said, I'm going to kill him, and he wasn't playing. And his mama says to Jacob, your brother's fitting to kill you. you got to go. So he picks up and runs away for years. Because Hunter is mad, Red is mad, and he's going to kill me. So I'm going to, I'm going to be taken away from everything I know and love because I'm fit to die. Now, both Jacob and Esau become fathers of nations, very, very different nations. Now, in spite of all this, God changes Jacob's name to Israel. You heard of that nation? So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and when he gets to Jacob, even though he's a schemer, even though he's a deceiver, God takes him through all of this stuff, changes, changes his name to Israel, and he becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Esau's descendants were called the Edomites, the Redites. Edom was a nation that plagued Israel in later years and was finally judged by God. But before they were judged and wiped off the face of the earth, there was one very, very famous Edomite named Herod the Great. What did Herod the Great try to do? He wasn't ever supposed to be on the throne. There was never supposed to be an Edomite on the throne of Israel. And what did Herod the Great do to all the boys in Bethlehem? Had them killed, trying to wipe out the legitimate Savior. you got to be very, very careful when you try to do things without God. Now, I want you to see this from the New Testament. This is in Hebrews chapter 12. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root comes up to cause trouble and defile many. So we've talked about the big three. Bitter root produces anger. So we talked about anger two weeks ago. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. We talked about sexual sin last week. And now look at this. Or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights 
as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. So he comes up after he finds out that Jacob's got the blessing. He comes in crying, oh, dad, give me the blessing. And, and Isaac's like, sorry, dude, it's already gone. And he, did, he did pronounce a blessing on him, but not, it wasn't the one that Jacob got. He was rejected, even though he sought the blessing with tears. Look at this. He could not change what he had done. Is there anyone who can change what they've done? I think it's better to make a wise decision before you get bound to sin. So let's define a godless person. A godless person is one who puts physical desires over spiritual blessings. And if you're, if you're following along in the listening guide, I, I actually marked this out. So I want you to mark out the word physical after you've written it in there. And we're going to change this definition to a godless person is one who puts desires, physical, emotional, spiritual desires over spiritual blessings of God. Now, the Old Testament uses two phrases um, to describe a godless person. The first one is vanity of vanities, and it literally means bubbles. Anybody want to catch a bubble? When you catch a bubble, how long does it last? Why, why do they keep disappearing? Why can't, why can't I catch them? Because they keep popping. Who, who chases after bubbles? Children. Babies. Children. Why do they keep chasing after bubbles? Even after you say, man, they're just going to pop. Why do they keep doing it? It's fun, and they don't know any better. They don't know any different, right? They're immature. They don't understand. So I want you to say, children don't understand. Okay, I, I kind of snuck that one up on you, so let's say it again. Children don't understand. When you catch the bubble, how much is left? Very little. I mean, you know, there's a little bit of residue. That's why I have a napkin here. There's just a little bit, very little. How much, how much is left of your breath on the mirror after it fades? Very little. <laughs> Godless people regularly chase after bubbles and they have very little to show for it. So I want you to say, children don't understand. Godless people won't understand. Say that. All right, let's try it again. Children don't understand. Godless people won't understand. They refuse to believe. So the first one is bubbles. The second phrase is chasing after wind. I have a box of wind here. I captured it earlier. Now, you're going to have to watch closely. But I got, when the wind was really flying outside, I mean 30 miles an hour, I captured it. And so what I want you to watch for is when I open this up, it's going to blow my hair. <laughs> and there is a hair up here. So you're going to have to look very, very closely. You ready? Ready? Here we go. <sighs> Did you see my hair move? Okay, would, would anybody go get me some more air? Anybody want to volunteer to go get some more air? Go outside and catch it and bring it back in? If you do, we're going to video it so we can broadcast it on social media that you're trying to capture air for New Life Community Church. Now, let's say that we're coming up to Christmas and your child wants to bring you the, the empty bubble that they caught. Mom, I'm thinking of you. What is it, son? Well, it used to be a bubble. What are you going to say? What are you going to think about that gift? What about this gift? What's oh, a big one? What's in there, son? Oh, you have to open it. See, be careful. Your hair's going to blow. It's a box of wind. The godless person chases after bubbles, chases after wind, and when they stand before God, all they have is empty hands or an empty box. Here's what I have to offer you. You gave, you gave your life for me. You died for me. Here's, here's what I have in exchange for that. Bubbles and wind. Bubbles and wind are the things in life that replace Jesus Christ as the most important. Whatever is on the throne of your life is most important, and I'm afraid that many of us have bubbles and wind on the throne. Solomon... <laughs> was one of the wisest men who ever lived, and he told us about bubbles and chasing after wind. Now, listen to this. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, 3,000 women. 
one a night takes you more than three years. I don't understand. In Ecclesiastes, he goes on to this relentless pursuit to discover the meaning of life. And he's the one that says everything is vanity, chasing bubbles, and chasing wind. And when I say relentless pursuit, let me just describe some of the things he tried to fill the void in his heart. Science, scientific discovery, philosophy, alcohol, architecture, property, luxury, materialism. He had the most fame in the, in, in the world. He had a thousand women in his harem. He had popularity. He had it all, and it was not enough. And what Solomon was missing, and, and by the way, you'll never compete with Solomon. You can't try all of those things to figure out the meaning of life. What was missing was contentment. He finally discovered this missing ingredient when he gets to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13. He says, now all has been heard. All the science, all the philosophy, all the alcohol, all the architecture, all the property, all the luxury, materialism, money, fame, sex, all of it's been done, and here's what I have concluded. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. In other words, without God, everything is bubbles and chasing after wind. So here's the the definition of contentment that we should be seeking after. Contentment is a byproduct of giving everything you have, are, and ever will be to God and then allowing Him to give back everything except that which will enslave us and then trusting in His decision. You notice the enslave us part? God will not give you something that will enslave you. If God doesn't give you something that will enslave you, who's the person offering something that will enslave you? Satan, the devil. I mean, it it seems like a no-brainer. He'll give everything back except that which will enslave us and then trusting his decision. Now, strongholds are the byproduct of slavery to anything else. So when you come to the end of your life and you stand before a holy God, I don't want you offering bubbles and wind. I want you offering something more significant. So if you want to offer something significant to him, if you don't want to be controlled by anger, sex, and godlessness, then you need to practice PBAs. You know what a PBA is? Anybody know? It's a polar bear alert. Now, if there were a polar bear walked in that, that hungry polar bear, let me just say that, walks in this back door, where are y'all heading? There's an exit right there. Out the door. Y'all going to be climbing over stuff, climbing over people. Get me out of here. I don't have to be fast. I just have to be faster than you, right? If a polar bear shows up ready to eat me, Run. The Bible says flee from sexual sin, not flirt with sexual sin. Flee from godless, not godlessness, not flirt with godlessness. So polar bear alert. And remember we said a polar bear alert should, should be this warning. I've got to get out of this situation. I need to be around people who will point me towards God, or I need to be praying, or I need to be saying, the Lord rebuke you because I don't want to be enslaved. So you need to do PBAs. If you do PBAs, polar bear alerts, if you turn everything you know of yourself over to God, by the way, that's step four of Celebrate Recovery. No, step three. I turn everything I know of myself over to God for his care and control. That's step three. If you do that, then you'll get HSP. You know what HSP is? Holy Spirit power. PBAs, HSP. If you don't do one and two, you know what you're going to get? BWS. Bubbles, wind, and strongholds. So a couple of weeks ago, it was during this, this series, I ran into a guy um, who's been mad at me for years. And, and he's been mad and he doesn't even know the story. So what, what happened was not even something between me and him. It was between me and somebody. Actually, it wasn't even me. It was somebody else and somebody else, but he got mad at me. And so he's been carrying this anger, carrying it for, for years. And, and not going to go into all the thing, but, but I saw for one of the first times in my life, and, and I, I didn't physically see, I saw in the spiritual realm, and it, in, in my mind, it was as if the demons were just crawling all over him because he's chained himself to anger. And I remember standing there going, wow, I don't want to be that guy. 
And I don't want you to be that guy or that girl either. There, <clears throat> there's a way to be free from your past. It's turn all of your life over to Christ's care and control. And most of the time, you go on offense with your prayers. You pray, the Lord rebuke you. Or you pray, God, give me power. Help me resist. God, surround me. We talk about all the time, surround us with, with warring angels. That's prayer on the offense. But there's times there's such a stronghold, you're going to need to be delivered from that. and You're going to need someone else to speak into your life and help you walk through being unchained from godlessness or anger or sexual sin. We're going we're gonna to start small groups in just a few weeks. Have a big party on, on October 24th out here. We're going to do 42. Uh, I don't know what else we're going to do. What else we're going to do? Anyway, we're going to have a big game out here, game night, and we're going to have food, and we'll have child care and all that stuff. And then in, in uh, November, we're going to do a, a four-week study, and we're going to talk about how to get free from our past, really free from our past. And we're asking some of you to pray. We're asking all of you to pray about being involved in that. Some of you to host it at your house. If you can't host it at your house and need to come here, that's fine. We're going to do both. But I think it's critical at this time in history for people to get free from their past. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you that you've given us a way to be free. You've given us your word. We ignore your word at our own peril. And we make decisions like Esau because we're hungry. Or because we're angry. Or because we're lonely. And we chain ourselves to the past and Lord, we need to be free. So raise up a, a group of people at New Life who are free and who will pass on to others how they can be free as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You have a registration card. If you would fill that out, if you have prayer concerns, put that on the back. And um, we'll, I'll pray over that. If it's okay to share, I'll, pray, I'll share that with our prayer group. If not, just say private and, and it'll just be for me and I'll pray over that. We have two baskets. One is our joy basket. And that's how you give at New Life. Um, remember, we're having today, we're having uh, our leadership lunch, and all of the proceeds from leadership lunch today goes to our special offering for Lake Charles. We're trying to raise $5,000. The board has agreed that the church will match that $5,000. So when we go in December, we want to hand them a $10,000 check to, to help recover. They, they've been fighting through FEMA and all kinds of red tape, and so very little money has come into them. The only thing that's happened down there is what has been donated, and so we want to take a check to them. If you can go on that trip, let me know because we, uh, we're about to have to make a payment on that. Um, so all of the proceeds that go, if you can't stay today, we have to-go boxes. It's Mexican stack up, one of my favorite meals. That means whatever you want to put on, you get to put on back there and, and hot sauce and all of those things. And so it's $6 a person, $20 per family. If uh, That's the maximum that we'll charge back there. Be sure to get your shirt. And remember, next Saturday night out here at 4.30, uh, we'll have jumps up, we'll have cornhole and then we'll have supper at 5 30 and worship at 6 30 next sunday morning we start the 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 massive thing at the campus in elkhart at um 10 a.m if you're willing to pray put that on your card and put it on there tell me what day you're going to go so i'll know who's going to be out there stand up hug four people tell them you love them and go get some mexican stack up